this city here is like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. I want to play with You want to put it up with Yeah. Uh, right there? Yeah. Okay. People do anything in front of a taxi driver. I mean, anything. You mean the masterpiece is more finished than yet, Mr. Mike? Because I think that you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Good morning, guys. How do you guys get to be a secret service man? What? I was just curious because I thought maybe I'd make a good one. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon, we decide on the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an on-air shout-out in two bonus episodes uh, a month, which we now have a uh, extensive back catalog going. Oh, yeah. we got five or six episodes uh, there for you guys, so if you want access to all those episodes, uh, head on over to patreon.com slash sleezoids podcast. But there's your plug for the week, and, oh, and iTunes. Um <laughs> We'll get it. Every week. Uh, (laughs) If you guys are listening on iTunes, which I know some of you are out there, I see the stats, uh, go on over to iTunes and write us, give us a little review over there if you're enjoying the show. It helps us find new listeners that way. But there's your plugs. Free listeners, you guys would have last heard from us two weeks ago, where we would have had uh, film critic Karen Hahn on to discuss Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise, which is a masterpiece. Which was I dope. Love it. Uh, he pretty much rose to the top of our uh, ratings chart pretty fast. Oh yeah, big old uh, five. Uh, and we paired it with The Legend of 1900, the uh, Giuseppe Tornatore uh, yeah. three hour long <laughs> uh, sort of uh, magical movie. Yeah, little, little, <laughs> a lot of magic, <laughs> a lot of cheese, but I, li- I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, Tim, Tim Roth playing, uh, being a music, uh, musical prodigy on, on a boat, uh, Titanic style. Um, both uh, movies were a lot of fun to talk about, so if you haven't heard that episode, go back and check that one out. Uh, patrons, you guys would have last heard from us last week, uh, where we would have been talking, uh, to coincide with the release of a On Star Wars Solo. story something. We <laughs> talked, we talked, uh, the original Star Wars, cause back before it was the biggest movie franchise in the world, it was, yeah. uh, you know, a little, a little pulp sci-fi film. Uh, and before we, pa- Disney grabbed it. Exactly. And then we paired it with, uh, Flash Gordon. Uh, which was a hell of a film to talk oh, about. Oh yeah, uh, we I, and I thought that movie was going to be like bad. Yeah, good, both of us had never really seen it, and uh, we only knew it registered uh, as like a so bad it's good campy yeah. type thing. And we both watched it and realized this is actually a pretty good movie. Yeah, everything uh, was intense. Lots of great, lots of great stylization. Yeah, great. Lots of fun. Um, so yeah, if you guys want access to that episode, we already told you how you can get there over on the Patreon. Um, but those are the last two weeks from us this week. Uh, we have a uh, very special guest joining us, uh, Anya Stanley. Anya, how are you doing? Good, good. It's good to be here. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, we're always coming. doing excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. What films uh, have you brought with you this week, and why have you paired them together? Well, when I was looking through the, the past episodes of Sleezoids, it occurred to me that there were no video nasties yet done. Ooh. So I chose, for my video nasty, I chose Driller Killer, 1979, Abel Ferrara. And one movie that, that pairs with it really well um, is... Uh, a much more elevated movie, A Taxi Driver, 1976, Martin Scorsese. And uh, I chose those films because um, they're they're both about deferred dreams that kind of manifest themselves into ultra violence. They both take place in New York. They're both very grimy, you know, influenced by that cinema verite movement. Um, They're both layered with these sleazy, sleazy textures that it's my favorite kind of New York movie actually is, is the grimy New York. It's very cinematic. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That New York. It's it's amazing how such a, like a, a, like dirty looking uh, parts in in these cities look so hypnotizing still and kind of, beautiful in a way yeah. in, in the dirtiest way <laughs> <laughs> all right well what did, wait before we do begin what was the that um you called them what was it v- video, video nasty yeah i've never heard that what is what's, yeah. what is that Ooh, i'm kind of new to this whole, whole exploitation thing myself so 
Okay, so in the early to mid eighties, or well, throughout the eighties, um, in in Great Britain, there was this whole craze about violent movies at, that um, they dubbed the video nasties. It was actually, I think, the okay. Sun Times, one of the tabloids in in England, that had dubbed it, dubbed them that. And these are movies that that range from from Driller Killer to to uh, what Video Drone, Friday the Thirteenth, mm-hmm. anything that was considered violent or or nasty at the time. And they were really worried about that. They made the whole what about the children? Won't someone think of the children argument? What if these movies get into the hands of children? And so they would have the police raiding uh, video stores, video <laughs> rental shops in England, what? confiscating these films. They actually passed a law um, in order to to facilitate that um, and basically censor these films. Crazy. And wow. there was uh, over, over 100 films on these list, this list, and uh, Driller Killer was one of them. Taxi Driver was not, actually. Oh, okay. That's, that's maybe it's just the the kind of like it, it's a very uh, aggressively violent movie like Driller Killer just the way the kills are <laughs> maybe that's the difference I don't know I mean the ending for uh, Taxi Driver which we'll get into obviously is crazy but yeah yeah well I mean a lot of them also wouldn't distinguish much from from again trash versus art yeah so right. and and I I think films that walked that line were really really perplexing to people who you know weren't sure. well versed enough to tell the difference because yeah. like you talk about abel ferrer now like that dude is 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 art <laughs> you watch yeah. his stuff now uh mm-hmm. but i could see back then them being like oh no <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> what is the point of this this is just this is infecting our children yeah. uh but anyway it's a great uh double feature we had never seen driller killer uh and i think we're really excited to talk about it but i guess we'll we usually kind of do the big one first and the next one after yeah. so uh what do you say we get into a taxi driver let's do it let's do it you talking to me you talking to me i don't know if it's weirder you or me you talking to me well, then who the hell else are you talking you talking to me well i'm the only one here I don't believe I've ever met anyone quite like you. Oh, yeah? You will never see a more chilling performance than this. Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. All right, we are talking Taxi Driver, the 1976 psychological violent neo-noir directed by Martin Scorsese, uh, written by a regular collaborator and, uh, you know, I guess a filmmaker in his own right, Paul Schrader and film critic. Um, and the film stars Robert De Niro, of course. I mean, I do, I don't know that we have to describe this one. (laughs) Yeah. It it won the Palm d'Or in 1976. Like there was, this is not a revisionist thing. Like this was a big movie when it came out. Yeah. And it's still a big movie. Uh, you can find it in, on the walls of dorm rooms everywhere. Maybe not (laughs) always for the right reasons, but, uh, it's, it's in, (laughs) From what I have heard a few people talk about it, I mean, people, you know, they, it's in they, the public consciousness. they look at movies differently. Like some people just like that, you know, they just want en- pure entertainment. So they just w- wait for the violence. But um, no, there's a lot more to it than that, obviously. Yeah. Well, the, the film stars De Niro as um, Travis Bickle, a uh, mentally unstable uh, Vietnam war vet uh, who works uh, at nights because he has some crippling insomnia. Uh, as a taxi driver in the, uh, as Anya already said, in the in the grimier, uh, dirtier, textured side of of New York City, uh, but the thing that distinguishes him is he has this very seething, biblical rage yeah. uh, for the community that he is himself a part of, and I don't think he realizes his own place in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I honestly feel like a bit of uh, like he does seem, especially in the beginning when they're just like hinting towards his past and, and things like that. He seems like he himself even understands that he needs to be busy all the time. He needs to keep himself focused on something, which is why he would do like the Mm. six to six. And I honestly felt like that was kind of him, maybe not knowing for sure, but subconsciously understanding that if he doesn't have some type of direction, he's, it's going to lead him to do these terrible things that he constantly thinks about. Yeah. Well, I think, I think famously the, the opening bit of the screenplay for this movie from Shader, Shader's screenplay has been quoted a lot because it, mm. it pretty much perfectly describes the character. There's never been a more perfect character description and actually like captured on film. But the, the, the thing that kind of gets passed on from it is that 
he says in the in the text of his screenplay that he has the smell of sex, uh, a sick, repressed, lonely sex, and that he is a raw male force. He's driving forward. He's driving towards something. Uh, you can't really tell exactly what it is, but if you look closer, you see the inevitable that mm. he moves towards violence. Yeah. And that from the opening image of him, you you see that this is a dude who is is so isolated, is is ready to pop at any second. Yeah, and it's like you, a and, and you you basically just watch it. It's a slow motion collapse. Yeah, to, uh, which is uh, I mean I, at the time it must have been kind of mind boggling to actually see a movie like that. Uh, yeah. Because I, I, structurally, I, I can't imagine there were too many uh, <laughs> movies that kind of have this trajectory and get to that ending right. in the way that this does. Uh, but Anya, why don't you walk us through uh, some of your thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, yeah. So like you said, he is he, he's a ticking time bomb in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and he uh, by the time you get to the ending of the film, this this bloody uh, uh, operatic ending, yeah. um, it, it makes sense. It, he was he's been building up to it this entire time. Um, from the very beginning of the film, and I think you're right. That's why that that opening scene is so important, is because it really lays the groundwork for everything. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think a I think a scene that really kind of it, it it tells kind of how the story goes from beginning to end is that scene where he's in the uh, in the taxi with the politician. Yeah. And it seems like mm-hmm. at first he's you know he's 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 he kind of seems like a nice guy. Honestly, he's he's just he's a very honest person. He's direct. He's personable at first, and then, and then as it goes, you see that his ideas are just kind of becoming, you know, just just more and more violent and dirty and evil, to be honest, yeah. because he just sees these people as filth and not even, you know, human beings. Yeah, he's just and you, like you could see the the politician. He's he's being diplomatic, but he's mm-hmm. definitely uncomfortable uh, yeah, in the back absolutely. seat there. Yeah, well, because he's he's telling the politician, "Hey, why don't you like put all these people in a in some sort of." camp maybe or something <laughs> yeah. like why don't you do something mm-hmm. about this get rid of all the scum and uh you know it's it, it, and then it, it's it's like he almost gets overwhelmed by his own thoughts and they just kind of start spilling out it's almost like he doesn't mean to be saying these things it's just they become like he it's it's uncontrollable because even after he says it he, he kind of looks like oh shit i shouldn't have said that you know what i mean but he's still yeah. It's the truth. And in his mind, it's the truth. Yeah, well, Um, because that's just kind of it, is the thing that they really get right in casting De Niro is that De Niro's a pretty handsome dude. And that he makes this character, you know, in his own way, likable and sympathetic, Mm -hmm. um, just in his performance. And when you see him talking to people... You're uh, especially when he first starts trying to like flirt with the girl at the at the office. Right. Now he's being a little aggressive, but he, yeah. it, it's in that way where you're like you see like a real person there. Mm-hmm. But over the course of the film, you realize that that is what he's sort of like he's expected. Like it's it's, it's yeah. almost him putting on the performance version of him. And it's only right. in moments like that taxi scene where he's driving the politician around, where like he's finally asked someone's asking him questions. Someone's asking. He's not. Someone's coming towards him, being like. Who are you? What is inside you? Mm-hmm. And it's when he reveals that that things get really, really sick and twisted. Yeah. Um, and like that's <laughs> and that's what it kind of seems. Uh, one neat touch that I like that Scorsese throws in here is that he kind of just like he doesn't have much of a personality other than these weird, sick ideas that he has. Mm-hmm. Cause like y- you'll see him talking about stuff that he's interested in. Like, uh, I'm trying to think what's the stuff that he h- ends up hanging on his wall. Like, have you seen that slogan? Have you seen that funny little comic or whatever? And oh, and I then, and remember. then he, and then he makes it like define him. Like, yeah, I, I can't, cause he right? tells, he tells her about a comic about where, it, uh, one day I'll get or organized or something. Like it's a joke Oh yeah, and she doesn't organized get it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and then he has a, a cartoon poster of it in his room later in in the background because clearly he's just like he's trying so hard to find some sort of connection with people. Yeah, uh, and it, it's not working because again, the only community that he's a part of is one that he hates and yeah. one that he doesn't actually understand, and you know, one that w- when he tries to bring other people into it, he doesn't realize why it doesn't work and why it's weird. Like when he takes her to the porno on their first date. Yeah, which and he is doesn't get such a weird scene. That's not a a problem at all like he d- he doesn't there's not even a moment that he seems like he's questioning it like it's like yeah this is what you do 
you know, you just, this, you, this you, is you, what I do on a normal Friday. So why wouldn't I bring my gal? You know, you, you, I mean? you take like, a girl yeah. to a movie, right? <laughs> exactly. I found those scenes to be more social, more unsettling than, than yes. the shocking ending just because they're so socially awkward. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, the, that scene, and then the the scene um, a little bit later when he um, he tries to call Betsy later on um, after she kind of storms off. Oh right, and I forgot about that. He he's calling her and he's trying to kind of finesse a second date, and she's not having it. We only hear his end of the conversation, right. but you can tell that that she's she's not into it. And eventually, Scorsese kind of pans away as we still hear the conversation talking as if we can't stand to be in the room any longer during this awkward moment. Yeah, well, it's one of my it's favorite parts so of the movie. It's almost so pathetic that, 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 that the yeah. camera, it seems like the camera feels bad. That it's like, right. we, we are showing a really vulnerable moment from this mm-hmm. dude. Uh, and you see it even previously when he, granted, he makes the mistake once again of asking a girl out in a porno theater, <laughs> but, but he, you know, he goes up to the clerk and he's just like, he's like, you know, just, can I get your name or something like that? Yeah. And oh, it's and she's hard not deny. having There's it. like, no. yeah, get the fuck out of well, here, Well, because clearly she gets that a lot, right? right? Oh, <laughs> of course. And I don't think, I could be mistaken, but I don't think the movie tells you he's in an adult theater yet. So when you oh, see not. it at first... I was thinking, like, I kind of felt bad for him, but then I, I, my brain went, oh, yeah, he's in a porno theater, dude. Like She, this, she gets all kinds yeah, of like, weirdos coming up to her. She would get this yeah. all the time, so of course <laughs> she'd be like, dude, fuck off, you know what I mean? She was like, even if it is genuinely sweet, like, there's no way yeah. for her to register that. Right. The movie just does such a good job of going back and forth with you, where it's like, I want to feel for you, man, but you're going you're too so far, and you're up, so dude. weird. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I get it, like, I get... I, I mean, I don't get where he's coming from, but I, you can um, you understand why he is the way he is. In His some isolation small way. in a in a general sense is something that a lot of people feel. Yes, and I think yeah. that mm-hmm. that is what Scorsese eventually under, that reach for uh, underpins. Like human, uh, yeah, they're just lo- looking yeah. for something, and that what you find is that a sort of rejection, a fi- uh, a lack of connection. And being in your own head that much can lead to some really, really twisted, disturbing uh, yeah. spots and can really fuck up your perception of just about every interaction you have with people. Yeah. And that's what it eventually does to him is that he, at, at that point he thinks that he's trying and he doesn't re- register why it's not working to the point where he thinks that he's just like, fuck it. I'm just going to mm-hmm. do, you know, I'm going to go buy a bunch of guns. <laughs> yeah. Cause and I maybe mean, that's the, that turning point is when he like goes into the building to, I think, try to talk to Betsy and yeah. they kick him mm-hmm. out and he, you can tell he's, he's so just, he's about yeah. to like punch that Afro dude. I can't remember his name, but uh, the guy <laughs> the Afro with the dude works just fine. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he looks like he's just about to ring him one. And then, uh, you know, obviously he's got to get out there cause they're trying to get the cops and stuff. Yeah. He's just got kind of his turning point again. He's got this, uh, he, cause Schrader called it a raw male force. Mm. He, he's just got some sort of force and he's looking for a space for it to go. Yeah. And yeah. you can see that he's trying and failing to put it in so many different areas that he thinks is the right place for it to be. Yeah. And he's always fucking it up. And then, you know, what eventually he finds is, is he, like, I, I think it's a great scene is the one where he's finally buying guns for the first time. Oh, yeah. And he's like, finally, he's, He's just like, he's found a spot where a dude is trying to sell him. And he's like, here's a real human connection with this dude who's selling me guns. <laughs> yeah. And then I, what I love, too, is at the end of that scene, he kind of has this moment where I think he realizes that he's just dealt, like, literally did a deal with someone he finds is the scum of the city yep. that he hates so much. Yeah, he's repulsed by it. Yeah. Because at the end, he, the guy's like, hey, you want some downers, some uppers, some heroin? Some, like, he has like just a, pl- a plethora of just yeah. like He's like, like I'm not interested in that stuff. <laughs> just yeah. a list. Like, yeah. So, yeah, I think he then realized kind of in order to for him to get this mm-hmm. kind of weaponry, he had to deal with the scum that he's u- going to use this weaponry against eventually. So it, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and, he, and he's got some, I mean, just in general, some real... Uh, <laughs> Because this gets sort of interesting around the time that they introduce Harvey Keitel, who is mm. the uh, I forget what his, what his name is in the movie. Yeah, it's sport. Him, though. What's that? That's right. Sport. Sport. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and Jodie Foster's uh, underage uh, prostitute character, yeah. um, where again he he thinks that he because again it is a messed up situation, but again he thinks that he's doing good in this sort of like 
he's he's in this moral thing of he's seeing sin and he's going to fix it and he's going to he's going to be the the redemptive character in this situation. Yeah. And again, all it does and Scorsese I think weaves this very correctly is it, he underpins all of the grossness of everything that he's doing. Even his interactions mm-hmm. with Jodie Foster just seem weird because they're so informed by everything we already know about him yeah. that even this right. idea of him as a savior doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't register because that's clearly not his thought of thoughts on it yeah absolutely. again it's like this weird like he sees himself as the as the the good guy who's going to save the girl but mm-hmm. and i mean and it's not like jodie foster's in a great situation but at the same time no. you're like you're not that guy man yeah <laughs> and he even has moments of of uh where, where you know jodie is being very aggressive just because it's what she's used to i imagine um from the clients and she just needs to get the job done so that she doesn't you know get in trouble from uh what was his name? Sport. 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 <laughs> Sport uh, yeah. And so there's even moments where like Robert De Niro is kind of like when she's being aggressive towards him, she, he's kind of like it, he's about to almost give into it and then keeps fighting it and stuff like that. It's just it. it the movie never lets you let's go. It's it's always doing this back and forth with his character where you're like, yeah, I get it, man. You're trying. You're trying, but you just you don't know how to do it at all. You don't know which direction to go in in any way. Yeah. He's had no coaching it it seems. Like there's no parental figure, there's no friends. He just seems like this lost soul that came from Well, nowhere. that's just it is I, I think that's really the key to this is that he's so repulsed by this thing that he's come back to after the war. But again, it's the only thing he interacts with. Yeah. So it's the only thing he's learning lessons from. He's watching pornos, which, yeah. man, it's not going to give you a great relationship with women, man. It's just no, not. No. And he he kind of highlights that in his phone call or in his narration later where he's like, yeah, women, they're they're like a union or whatever, mm-hmm. like, like disparatingly. And again, he's not pro worker either apparently <laughs> even though he is himself could be part of a taxi union oh, what, what was the part where he, when he wasn't oh, pro with, worker no when he was talking about uh, like disparaging women as in like they're all a union oh. like they're like they're keeping everything away from him like I he's gotcha. he's got to like negotiate like a right. relationship or sex or anything like that but that's what he almost feels like it almost feels like a deal to him in some yeah, way yeah everything is transactional he has to manipulate people yeah. into these relationships rather than just letting them naturally occur yeah it's very I guess the the modern term for it is is incel behavior. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. Uh. Which a brief uh, look online, and you do not want to know the places that I looked, but I'm pretty sure I'm on a watch list now. Uh, but I, I <laughs> looked do up. Your research, I looked up some forums, and incels love this movie. They're like representation. Like Travis Bickle is us. Oh, are you serious? I'm serious, right. man. They unironically see him as a hero. Yes, they they That's do. Scary as all hell. Yep. How can you, you gotta be like just dense to look at this film and go like Travis is This the is guy pro here. Travis yeah. Bickle. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like at the end, I mean, uh, I guess, what, I don't know. Yeah, I at guess the we'll end, get when, there. When, yeah, because I mean, there's a lot to talk about within these last like half, half an hour. Uh, but when at the end, I mean, he does the boom to himself like three yep. times. Does that not give you a, a kind of a significant tell that this guy's an unhappy person who right. he's rejecting see- himself? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They see him as this tragic hero when I don't even think he sees himself as that. Yeah. If anything, he uh, <laughs> is sitting in the blood and sitting in the carnage. He even goes, holy fuck fuck and yeah. and they're like boom <laughs> and there's no bigger tell than the fact that after that they have the big hero ending where the papers write about him being like oh man the good guy with, sure. with with a with, with a gun he did it he uh he he he, he saved the day and uh, the only reason is because he didn't get caught almost attempting to assassinate a politician yeah so that's what right. he does like 30 minutes it's a very fine line between uh hero and <laughs> just total <laughs> evil person yeah exactly <laughs> The whole ending is like this commentary. Oh, commentary on uh, like a cult of celebrity. The very mm. thing that that the the incel sort are doing in celebrating him mm-hmm. as a character. Yeah, because it's kind of like get your like even if it's for the worst possible thing, I guess get your name out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Become, become the the famed whatever it is. Or yeah. Infamous. Or and I, I yeah, I think I think it kind of speaks to like what what people want like what people actually value in that in that sense. It's sort of like the same ending that Scorsese does in in King of Comedy, where in that De Niro Ooh. takes over a uh, uh, he 
takes hostage like a on a live broadcast of, oh, okay. of a TV of a comedian, uh, and he ends up getting the job after doing that because they were like, "We liked your stuff, kid." Like, oh, like really? it's the same thing. Like, it's it's the same idea of like the they're rewarding this behavior with the you know because it's it's very it just worked out the proper way yeah and like it's almost people watched it they saw the energy they liked it they 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 were attracted to it in its own way and uh, they obviously also don't have all the information at the same time Mm -hmm. uh, but they're willing to elevate it and yeah it's it's a really (laughs) it's a really damning way to end the movie especially because in the final moments of the film when we get Bickle driving away in his taxi we get a quick flash of that rage all over again and being like, we know that the timer has just been reset. Right, right. <laughs> this is going to happen again, and, and who knows who it's going to be pointed at this time. Maybe it won't just be a, you know, a, a stash house for for pimps. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe maybe it will be a, you know, a, a, an innocent woman or a politician or any anybody. Yeah, and I, I also love uh, Scorsese the way that he uh, had the camera move throughout the the entire the pimp house or whatever mm. uh, after the scene so it's kind of like after you watch he's him showing go in you the damage and yeah it's like here's the damage now it's showing you all of what just happened in like a linear perspective yeah. um, like it's just going down the stairs showing all this blood on the wall like the the body parts that are just oh man and the bit where the dude's the hand explodes reminded oh, me of Rolling Thunder shot. oh yeah dude. <laughs> absolutely I mean it's kind of got that feel like the ending. It's yeah. it, it's it's that I you know it's the rage has built to its yeah it's got it's point. got like that like impotent rage to it like yep. a dude who's and then just, it's just like a total <laughs> unleash of of just primal energy yep <laughs> and yep. it's crazy and I also which was interesting too with when he's getting his guns and uh, finally it, he he finally feels like he has something that he understands in a well, way. Well, he feel, he he's feel, so he, excited. He, he like feels the power of holding it, yeah. right? And then it's funny when he immediately points it at two women right. standing outside or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's what he does. Yeah, <laughs> the, the very first thing. It's right. And I love the focus of it, like just the way that the camera works too. It's such yeah. a great shot. Another scene where they kind of, they, they kind of, tell him, they try to tell him it was all the cabbies who, who in themselves, you know, they have a lot of, they, they say a lot of shitty things, a lot of slurs, a lot of whatever, but it seems like that's like the one little community that maybe could have saved him if he just latched yeah, on. Yeah, and, well, and even and even they don't really seem to like him that much. Like they, no, like they, but like even they the t- one guy does say like, dude, just, I, I, could, I would give anything to be you right now, your, your youth, your freedom. Just go have a beer, go get <laughs> laid, man. Just, just <laughs> stop. Like, you know, because he essentially tells him, yeah. I want to go hurt people. I want to do yeah. something about it. And you're like, well, dude, just go have a beer, man. <laughs> Come on, man. You're 26. It's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, again, again, it kind of returns to that, the, the biblical side of it, that he's yeah. just got this seething, uncontrollable rage that seems weirdly political, but also just like at, at everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, yep. uh, but his, his connection to that community also, you know, is just again he's learning all of his lessons from it so it's just it's a weird a really weird case of where he's he's looking outward thinking that he's seeing outward but really seeing inward so again that's when he points the gun at himself as he's like i i am the thing that i'm trying to now kill i am the filth yeah yeah and, and i think it's his first i think he's once again i think he's always subconsciously had it i do feel like he's kind of he doesn't. He thinks himself is kind of worthless, and then yeah. maybe is projecting that onto the streets that he's a part of. And then that that part, that scene, is where he, I think, fully comes to a recognition of like this is mm-hmm. who I have become, or I am, I guess rather, because he kind of has been the guy. <laughs> it's just been building to that final point. All right. Well, I guess we'll enter the reductive rating round on this one, Anya. This is the part of the show where we we take all away all the words, all the nuance, and we just reduce the movie. Between a number between one and five, uh, and you can for, give like a, a brief uh, reason why, if you yeah, like brief as well. reason. So for me, a super easy five out of five. I don't even think I need to say why. I've already <laughs> said enough that I, I really love this movie. I love everything about it. I love uh, both Schrader as a screenwriter, who, by the way, his new movie coming out, First Reformed, best movie of twenty eighteen, calling it uh, right nice. now. <laughs> um, 
Paul Schrader's excellent, Scorsese, excellent, both of them at top of their game. De Niro, excellent, so uh, there's that. Uh, and if anything, the last thing I'm going to mention is that brief Martin Scorsese cameo, <laughs> say which it. is super messed up when you actually think about how he casted himself in that role as just this dude who is Do like... Do you think it was because he didn't want to put... I heard that it was because he didn't want to put somebody else in that position, and so he was just like, I'll just do it, I'll just... Like yeah, well, because he guess, knows like, it's a completely irredeemable role. Yeah, uh, exactly. And it, it, it's a dude who even Travis looks at him and goes, "Dude, like, really? Yeah. Like, that's a little, that's a little far." I, because, I, dude, I also read he's, it at he's the so end, racist that he's like, "I'm going to kill my wife just because a black person like touched her." Basically, like, it's it's unreal that Scorsese actually like gave made him have those lines for himself i can't imagine yeah. putting mm-hmm. yourself in that place to i do did that. see though i thought at the end when it showed uh de niro kind of staring up at the at the um mm-hmm. at the window uh, i don't know there's something about his eyes that made me feel like he actually would have been fine with oh, doing yeah. it because he'd be like you know he, they're part of the filth or whatever yeah know? well on, only at first i think he was just shocked that someone mm. was revealing their dirtiest inner thoughts just to him just like that because it's, yeah. it's pretty much right away if, if anything martin scorsese uh, pushes him on the path to violence which is just a sure. crazy mm-hmm. bit yeah. to include for and himself he's the director yeah so like, that's kind of interesting too. <laughs> uh but anya for you uh for me it's an easy five very easy that's it's I think it did uh, what Driller Killer did, but uh, much better. And, I, <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, you know, I love Driller Killer as yeah. well. I love, you know, Abel Ferrara. Uh, but um, the the message here was delivered so provocatively mm. um, and, and filmed so beautifully. You know, it's hard to make something disgusting and grimy seem beautiful, but in his own way, uh, yeah. Scorsese managed to do it. And, um Gosh, I've watched this movie like maybe now, I'm not an incel, but I've watched <laughs> this movie like maybe 12, 13 times. I've seen it a million times and I find something new to appreciate about it and read um, from it every mm. single time. It's a very um, rich think, film for sure. Yeah, yeah. Schrader's screenplay is just amazing. Travis Bickle as a character is just so simple and so layered at the same time. And um uh, I will never stop loving this movie, mm. no matter what the incels uh, have to say about it. <laughs> yeah. You got it wrong, incels. Yeah. It's good, but yeah. you got it for the wrong reasons. Uh, and for right, you, right. Um, it's like Fight Club. Fight Club oh, is yeah, the same yeah. way. Yeah, no, for sure. For, for people just take it the wrong way. And yeah. it, it kind of it sucks because I'm, I'm a big fan of Fight Club, but I, I know yeah. that it kind of... Some, some, I think you've mentioned it that yeah. you're, it's kind of like the fan base sometimes can ruin it a little bit just because a lot of them seem to not quite get what it's what it's saying. Yeah, uh, so, a, lo- yeah. a lot of people are pro Tyler Durden. Right, and you're like, you're like, did uh, you see the ending of that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tyler <laughs> Durden was literally destroying his life and yeah. a terrorist, and like, come it's on, like, did you watch half of it and then just <laughs> yeah. turn it off. And be like, that was great. It's all good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm also gonna give it a uh, five out of five. Um, I mean, for all the reasons you guys have said, I think a big part of uh, why this movie is, you know, it's got it's got the, that feel of, of griminess and dirtiness, but also that uh, kind of beautiful aspect to it is I think the score helps quite a bit because mm, yes. it's got that smooth jazz going throughout it when he's, at least when he's a content human being yeah. or, or somewhat content. And, and that, uh, that opening bit is iconic when his taxi goes through the smoke there. It's like, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, I think uh, I think that was a big part of it. And yeah, I, I'm going to give it a five out of five for sure. Beautiful. All right. Well, that was Taxi Driver. And I think we're going to move straight into Abel Ferreira's The Driller Killer. So let's do that. Yeah. All right, so we are talking The Driller Killer, the 1979, 
sort of uh, comedy horror by <laughs> Abel Ferreira. Kind of. I mean, I don't think necessarily, but uh, there's some moments that are definitely it's absurd. Comedic, yeah. Like just because I think that's it. I think it's because of the absurdity and kind of the aggressiveness. Sometimes you're like you're so overwhelmed that you have to almost smile at it. Yeah, and I'm I'm not totally certain on this, but was this one of his earliest films, Anya? Yes, it was one of his early ones. This was before Bad Lieutenant. This was before Miss Forty Five. Um, yeah, yeah 45. I think I don't know if it was his first, but it, it was definitely one of his earliest. Yeah, because uh, it, it seems a uh, you know even a bit lo-fi even for him uh, by later mm-hmm. films that he would make, uh, and it stars himself, which I imagine uh, you would only oh, do for budgetary him? reasons. I didn't even. Yeah, that's him. Oh, dude. <laughs> oh shit! I, mean, but I feel dumb. The, the thing that I think we'll get into immediately that separates this from Taxi Driver is Taxi Driver is the the breakdown of a dude who is who who is sick because of a lot of of both political and just general isolation reasons. This is the breakdown specifically of a creative. Yeah. Uh, And that's why it feels very personal to Ferreira, uh, who obviously himself is a creative, but this feels just like pure artistic, uh, frustration, uh, right. Expressed in the, uh, I'm going to say a pretty gross way. Yeah. Uh, Instead of a brush, he grabs a drill. (laughs) Yeah. So it stars Ferreira as an artist, a a painter who basically just goes absolutely batshit insane while struggling (laughs) to pay his bills. Uh, (laughs) Yep. We've all been there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just hopefully he didn't grab a drill in the process. I don't know how he got this footage of me. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Heavily inspired by your life. Yeah. But Anya, why don't you walk us through uh, this film? Okay, so like you said, this is an artist who's been driven to insanity while he's trying to pay his bills and work on his paintings, and he's looking after his female roommates who who apparently need babysitting. These are like childish women. Yeah, um, yeah, just apparently. like pretty much do drugs and eat pizza, and that's like and, and shower that's or it. whatever. It is. That's yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> And save plenty and of so water. Yeah. Eventually, at night, he just kind of starts prowling the New York streets and killing homeless people at random with his drill. Uh, <laughs> that's Which that's is like literally that's what the movie. Yeah. Yeah. This, what you get. this movie is is kind of like Taxi Driver in that both films feature failure and frustrations as a plot device. Mm-hmm. They kind of they drive all of the drama and most of the action. Uh, genre films still do this today, but less violently in my mind uh, with films like Whiplash, uh, Black Swan both do this. And and Abel Ferrara, he, he kind of <laughs> he kind of illustrated this brutal butterfly effect that occurs when I guess what we would call it today is economic anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when when it's when it's left kind of untreated and left to fester. Yes. And uh, this is way before, you know, uh, uh, Trump voters were, were blaming economic anxiety for the crap that they were pulling. This guy did it here, but he did it with a drill and to innocent people. <laughs> yeah, because, <Yeah>, <laughs> again, it, it seems like he has sort of uh, similar to Bickle. He has just, a, again, a, a sort of rage for the, the, the derelict and the homeless and the and yeah. the scum as he as he would, like he would refer like them to almost a, a subconscious fear that he has it's almost like he's, he's afraid is. of being becoming the homeless so exactly. he's kind of taking it out on them yeah. in some way it's exactly what it is because yeah. because he he's just like he can't he can't pay his bills and he thinks that the next step is that he becomes homeless. Right. And that if, if right. anything, he's like, just like the homeless. Basically, like his, kill them off. There will just be no such thing as homeless. Exactly. <laughs> but see, his, his 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 thought is we should not have homeless people. And I'm like, bro, I'm with you. Homelessness <laughs> sucks. And yeah. but then he's like, by killing them. And You're I'm like, like, whoa, whoa, that's where you lost <laughs> yeah. me. That's where you lost me. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, if anything, bro, I just would hope that your rent was lower. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got a lot of stressors constantly needling him throughout the beginning of the film, and he faces all this constant negativity over his work as a, as an artist from mm-hmm. the the women that he lives with, from his manager, and uh, the only thing that keeps him going is like, well, I'm going to sell this painting. I, I got this work in progress. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to be rich. It's this yeah. is my masterpiece. But then all he needs to do that is like this calm space to finish his work, and then that's immediately denied when this <laughs> avant garde no wave punk band <laughs> rents the apartment space below his <laughs> and then uses it to kind of hone their, their free form sound. Yeah. And so he's, he's now he's just irate. He's, he's absolutely livid and yeah, his, him over hopes, the edge. 
<laughs> yeah, his fo- his hopes for financial salvation and critical praise that, that it just it's it's gone. It's gone, and he reaches his breaking point, and he takes out his frustrations on what he considers to be the riffraff littering the streets of New York City. Yeah, the scum. And it, and it's here it. that formally Ferreira just transforms the film into just a total gutter slasher. Yeah, yes. uh, the, the 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 killings are just so over the top and so brutal, and he's. He's taking a power drill right through people. Uh, their heads. And yeah, shit. the one dude where he goes up to, he's sleeping, and he just like starts drilling into his head, and the dude's like yelling, and he just keeps like, going. That's in how and, you wake up. Yeah, like, that's and you're like, terrifying. holy shit, man! Like I've seen a psychotic breakdown, but even Travis Bickle was like not not going this far. Yeah, uh, it, it's got sort of like an, a, an American Psycho feel to it at that point, where you're just like, this dude is just completely unhinged. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love the uh, the bum that he meets that's like super positive and yeah. like upbeat. <laughs> yeah. That was my favorite part of the entire film because he's just like, "Hey, what's that? You got a drill? Oh, oh you want a drink? <laughs> oh man, I've got some old lady problems. I don't know about you, brother." Then all of a sudden, just like, "Oh God, no!" Like it's there's like there's actual comedy in that, and yeah. I was losing my mind. Just this super positive bum. It was just such a great scene. <laughs> such a great scene. Yeah, because again, he he just he, he turns them into just like a personification of what he fears, right? So that he can yeah, kill right. it. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. what's what's one of my favorite touches in this that Ferrer throws in is that this this sort of attitude that he has and the way that he's transferring it onto these people actually affects his art. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because his eventual painting that he tries to sell to the dude uh, who is like putting pressure on him to finish it quickly. Obviously, he's not in the headspace to actually finish that art in a way that he would want to. Uh, and as much as he thinks power drilling the shit out of people is uh, helping him, <laughs> if, if anything, the effect it's having on its art is that it's it's just he he starts making art as if he's power drilling people. It's just like right. uh, I just do it and it works. Yeah, uh, and, Should and have channel that energy into the painting. Yeah. <laughs> and then, well, and that's just it, is that the dude, uh, the dude comes up to him and even says, this is garbage. Like, there's yeah. no, there's no you anymore. You're not expressing this anything. Just a technical. Because again, yeah, he, he yeah. says that you're, you're, you're simply a technician now, yeah. which of course he is, because all of his expression is going into a literal technical to- device. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, which is just a, a really awesome touch. I, th- uh, I think another uh, great thing just for his uh for kind of his character rage that's building throughout is i think when he sees that band they, initially they move in and they're just like really loud obnoxious the the, mm-hmm. the lead singer tony is like super eccentric and just kind of out there um the landlord is even like eh, it doesn't bug me it's totally fine which i was shocked by because you figured <laughs> the landlord would be like guys what the hell um <laughs> but i think what he sees is because the band becomes throughout the film somewhat successful like they're doing shows the girls that he's roommates with are going to these shows mm. they're kind of becoming fans with with the band and friends with the band and then so i think what he's seeing is these other artists being successful eventually mm. so that only drives him further because he hates these guys guys on a personal level too and he's like why are these jackasses getting the limelight where i'm this you know he's he thinks of himself as this like really deep you know artist i imagine so um yeah i thought that that was pretty interesting yeah it feels very introspective for such a film that most people would connect with like an inherent distance because it's a straight genre film uh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, in a lot of ways, but Ferrera, it feels like it's coming for a very personal place of frustration for Ferrera. And honestly, <laughs> yeah. by shooting all these brutal scenes and by getting to do this, it feels like he is expressing himself <laughs> yeah, that way. Yeah. So uh, honestly, it, it gets very metatextual when you read it that way. Definitely. Uh, and especially Ferrera's performance, which mm-hmm. is insane. Yeah, he's, um, he's just angry throughout the whole also, thing. Also, like I gotta say it, there's, to there's no part as gross in this film as the bit where Ferreira eats pizza. I was. I, I said did. that on Twitter. Yes. Yeah, did you? <laughs> the most disgusting scene in the entire film. In all of cinema. Yeah, and, 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 and he's all of cinema. And, and, and like, I watched Cannibal Holocaust like three yeah, times. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was just going to say that. I was like, seen. I would have rather like, like, three dicks get drilled in a row, yeah. close up, blood everywhere, then watch, watch him it. eat half that pizza again. <laughs> that was the worst thing I've ever... I used to have a buddy that would chew like that, and I wanted to wring his neck. I swear to God, it was just like... Dude, that scene spoke to me on a on a 
animalistic level. <laughs> the pizza wasn't even appealing. It looked like someone poured a jug of water over it. Yes. Yeah, it's the gr- it's oh, soggy. God. It was just oh, it was so nasty. Oh, it's so gross. <laughs> I'm like thinking about it, just I'm almost upset. <laughs> And for those who haven't seen Driller Killer, it, he just eats his pizza. That's all it is. He's eating pizza with his roommates and yeah, he does it in such up. a nasty way that I mean, he doesn't like shove it down his pants or anything. But he's just, <laughs> I don't know. It's just foul. It's that would have probably it's been better nastiest. if he shoved it down his pants. Again, it, it's just he, he's in that weird unhinged state, right? And and it even affects the way he eats pizza. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And, he, and he also like the, the roommates just kind of look at him like. Uh, we Dude. wanted some of that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're also starving. Yeah. So, and he's just like, he eats half of it in like 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, oh, that was gross. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we'll get to sort of the climax of this one. Uh, basically after going on a rampage and doing all of this, he finally gets the piece of art done. Uh, and we, we kind of talked about it briefly where the, the dude he's going to sell it to comes in and says, wow, this is garbage. This isn't even you anymore. Like you're not making, this isn't a, a, a painting by you. It's a, it's a technical piece. Yeah. Uh, and he's so frustrated by that, obviously again, cause he's not going to make, he's not going to get paid. He's not going to make his rent. It was all for nothing. He basically just kills everyone in the movie. Yeah. He just, he's like, that's, I'm the, done. that's the last of it. He's like, <laughs> that was my last it. chance. Yep. I'm done. <laughs> He's like, you're all going to, he stops killing homeless people and he just starts killing everyone. Cause one of uh, the girls, anything that's personal it, it, to him. Yeah. One of the girls in his place, I think moves back in with her, her ex-boyfriend or ex-husband mm, or something right. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he, he kills, he kills uh, the, the, the paint distributor or whatever. Yeah, the paintings. Pins him to the door. Too. Yep, crazy, yep. uh, crazy. But my, my, death. my favorite bit and I absolutely lost it i actually i think i tweeted about this too because i lost it when he does this he's he's doing this thing where it's it's a classic like suspense uh stealth kill sequence where he's gonna walk in and you don't and you you know that he's there but is he gonna get the guy who's just sitting in the room and it's the it's uh the girl's ex-boyfriend or ex-husband or whatever and he comes in behind him and he's being really quiet he comes up right behind him and he's trying to be really stealthy and then he, he covers the dude's mouth. He's just like, yeah, you're not going to let out a scream because I, I don't want the girl to hear that I'm here. Mm-hmm. But then he power drills him. <laughs> yeah. in the, and I'm like, dog, that, that's the loudest weapon you could possibly That also use. makes sound, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's the, Zero like, noise discipline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking if I was like playing a stealth video game and then all of a sudden I just started, I pulled out a power drill out of my backpack yeah. and just started like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, 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 oh my god! And again, Ferrera's expression on his face when he's killing these people is nuts, and the gore effects are, uh, yeah, insane. It's that '70s like red paint kind of thing, yeah. Too, which I just, I love that. It's got such an effect to it. Yeah, it's so stylized. It looks yeah, awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, uh, like the the only movies that I've really seen do it in, in more. Uh, Modern times has been like uh, Sweeney Todd. I don't know if you've seen oh, that, yeah, but yeah. they do like that oh, yeah. red paint kind of blood thing. Um, and uh, I just that that I love. It's just like it, it's kind of over exaggerated, but the style it just I don't know. It brings almost life to it. Like you're reminded that that's the source. <laughs> yeah, and it's a huge contrast to Scorsese's uh, desaturated blood at the end of mm. uh, uh, Taxi Driver, Very true. which he had to do in order to appease the MPAA, who threatened to give it an X rating. Oh, wow. so he had to he make it darker, up, essentially? He had to make it darker, which ended up making oh. it look even more shocking and, yeah. and yeah. disgusting. <laughs> Definitely. Because I think that's, Sorry. I mean, that's what blood really looks like when yeah. it's getting into that kind of degree. So, I mean, if anything, they they made it more violent for the film. Yeah, that's an odd right. choice. Yeah. That is odd. Yeah, well, because I think they didn't know at the time. They didn't know yeah, that, the, the, like, the, the, that the sort of flashy yeah. style that's over the top is actually less realistic yeah, than so the version that they asked them to do. Like, that yeah. won't commute as much. You're just going to – like that's kind of why – once again, it's not comical a lot of the time. But there are moments – like there's the moment where the uh, the, the two bums are, are – just talking like they're yeah. just kind of like yeah and this guy was giving me a real hard time all of a sudden he just <laughs> runs, runs full in, speed yeah. into frame and just like tackles the guy with a drill basically it's just like there, there are some real uh almost slapstick moments to this yeah um and then the blood which is a nice touch it. honestly yeah yeah for sure it works really well for the film well i guess we'll have to enter the reductive rating round uh on this one for me driller killer uh i, I think it's gonna be a four 
Uh, oh wow! Yeah, okay. do you know what? I I liked it a, a lot as a personal expression from Ferrera, and and luckily enough for me, I was actually familiar a, a lot with Ferrera, and I hadn't quite seen the side of him before. That I, I'd seen Miss Forty Five, and one of uh, honestly an all timer for me, King of New York, uh, is amazing. Mm. I still and, gotta see those. And his uh, vampire movie, The Addiction. So I'm pretty familiar with Ferrera, and I had never seen. Honestly, he's he's a filmmaker I don't necessarily read as a personal filmmaker. Mm. So it felt really refreshing, honestly, to see a film both starring him that are, is very much about his own frustrations and done in that very lo-fi but still highly artful, stylized um, kind of filmmaking that he goes for. So I, I think I, because I know that this film isn't hugely pro- popular in his filmography, but I had, I honestly had a total blast with it. Yeah. Uh, but for you, Anya. Uh, four, yeah, I would give it a four as well. Uh, it's it's not Taxi Driver, obviously, nope. but no. it's um, you know, for a video nasty, I, I write this column uh, at Daily Grindhouse about as I'm going through the entire list of video nasties, and this is one of the best ones that oh. they have to offer. It's up there with Blood Feast, and and uh, <laughs> that the, sounds amazing. Well, we are going to consult that Fe- list. No, that's pretty the most metal name I've ever heard. <laughs> it is lovely. It is Make a sure lovely to send song. us that link because we're definitely going to go through that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's it's. It's one of the, the the better films, I think. I, I I went into this completely blind, only seeing that that Vipco cover of the of the film with the, uh, you know, the guy screaming with the uh, oh, yeah, the, the, the hole yeah. with blood, mm. which was the reason why it got put on the video nasties list in the first place was because of that cover alone. Most of the people who were on the the um, the committee that was in charge of that sort of thing, they hadn't actually watched the film. Yeah, it was it was just because the poster had like the head drilling the bit on yes. the poster. That was why they so they were just like that's that. that was, and they were like immediately judge that book by its cover. Yeah, I mean, they, they, fair I enough. They nailed it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and Vipco at the time, the distributors, they they knew what they were doing and what they were advertising. So they took out full page uh, uh, cinema magazine ads at the time for the Joel Killer with this poster on it, which was then you know <laughs> cited you know on the on the in the halls of Parliament. Like, look at what we're showing. <laughs> our children you know well, so much think of the children it, it's like uh, the description that I've heard used for drill killer I didn't come up with it myself was art house meets grindhouse and I think that that's actually pretty apt yeah for mm. drill killer it's Absolutely. tone and commentary you know on on the failure of the American dream it's it's not something you'd expect in this kind in a movie called drill killer no so um, yeah I was I was pleasantly surprised by it and I give it a four Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to give it a, a four out of five. This this really surprised me. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Uh, I just w- when it did say you know driller killer, I imagined it was going to be a pretty surface level film. Honestly, just kind of uh, and and when I first initially heard, I didn't know it was uh, Abel Ferreira. But True. but yeah, it was it was it was great. I I love the performance by by Abel. He he just gives such a, like a raw <laughs> kind of a, a, another kind of raw nerve performance similar to Robert De Niro. He's just kind of always on edge and just not very friendly ever. The uh, the direction for some of the kills were just <laughs> crazy and gruesome and so in your face and and uh, a lot of fun in that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. Yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. Well, I guess that's going to be it for this week's Sleezoids. Uh, Anya, uh, thanks so much for bringing these two films. We we had a lot of fun talking about both. If you've got anything to plug, now is the time. Uh, I guess just my um, my website, which is where I keep most of my, my work on my online portfolio, which is AnyaWrites.com. That's A-N-Y-A, writes.com. Tanya without the T. And uh, my Twitter is actually, I don't have a LinkedIn anymore because I never get any work from it. But <laughs> Let uh, me know if anyone ever does. Yeah. <laughs> right. as, yeah. As, a, as a freelance writer, all of my work comes from Twitter. So uh, yep. my, my Twitter handle is at Bookish Plinko. And that's bookish as in like someone who writes, likes to read a lot. And Plinko is in the Price is Right game. I don't know what I was thinking awesome. when I came up with it, but now I'm stuck with it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I generally talk about horror and video nasties and Driller Killer is included among those uh, on my Twitter. Awesome. Well, yeah, if you guys, I'm sure our audience is very interested in uh, in checking you out and your, your column. So yeah, anyway, that was uh, a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, Patrons, you guys uh, will hear from us uh, next week. Uh, which what, what are we talking again? Oh, we're doing Vertigo. We're gonna do we're doing our first Hitchcock. We're gonna do Vertigo, and we're gonna pair it with De Palma's Body Double. Yeah, which is gonna be uh, a a lot of fun. (laughs) Uh, And then two weeks from now, 
we're going to be talking. Uh, I don't. I don't. E- I don't even know if I want to say because I don't want to spoil it. Oh no! But we're, okay, we're we're going to do Can a Stuart. A we're going to do a Stuart Gordon double feature, and we're going to have a very, very, very special guest on uh, that you won't want to miss, uh, which you will see. In, now I know what you're talking in, about. <laughs> uh, which you will hear from us uh, again in two weeks. Thanks so much for listening, uh, everyone. Again, rate right on iTunes. Go subscribe on Patreon for more episodes. Yes. Uh, and that's going to be it. Uh, keep us lazy, everybody. Keep it sleazy.